crossfire, and margins are bigger, the most wonderful rhubarb pies in the world. Two of them are on the silent auction up there. And she, she was lucky to, to be able to get out of the house, and her daughter was with her, as well as their two little dogs. And they're at a hotel right now, but they are in need of some place to live for a while. They're waiting for an adjuster to come. And Judy, correct me if I'm wrong, the fire was contained to just the dining room area, but there's, but there's smoke damage. Oh, 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 oh,
I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give grace. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For a million belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. The second reading is from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are the children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Here ends the reading. It is time for our children's message, so I'll ask all the children in the congregation to come up. And why don't you guys sit the, on the floor in just a little semicircle in front of me today? Thank you. You know, I've always said I'm going to do a grandparents' sermon and make them come up. Do you think I should do that sometime? <laughs> well, I'm Pastor John. And it's good to be with you today. Now, I'm a dad. I have three little kids. And you can see their faces on my socks today. Can you believe that? Their mom got me these socks for Father's Day. And they did it too. With me. So this is Lydia. She just turned six. This is Zeke, who's going to be four later this summer. And this is Sophia. And she's brand new. She's only two months old right now. <laughs> now, being a father, it's kind of like having a job. Let me tell you that. Did you know that? Being a parent is like having a job. For us in the church, we talk about that as a vocation. Not a vacation where you get to go somewhere and have fun, like all the folks come to the Black Hills here for vacation. But vocation is a job that you have. And God gives us all these different jobs that we get to do to care for people. To care for the world that God made. And so today, on Father's Day, we are celebrating one type of vocation that all those dads have as their job, to help take care of their family. Now, what do you think my favorite color is? Yes? Yellow! You are so bright. I love yellow. It's just so bright and happy and wonderful. And this is what I try to do with my dad. I try to have lots of fun with my kids. It's on my, it's on my socks and on my shirt. You are right. There's even a little yellow on my stole here. In our reading that we just heard, the person who wrote that letter says, there are no longer divisions between you. There is no longer man and woman. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer Jew or Greek. But we are all one. So, I want you to look around right there. Do you think everybody who's here has the same vocations, has the same jobs? No, they all do different things. Some of them are grandparents who get to care for their families. Some of them work jobs where they get to take care of things <coughs> out in the world. They have vocations in their own families too. All of those things make us different from one another. But, God also says, because I love all of you, you are all part of my family. So do you see this robe here? Yeah, what color is that? White. White. Why do you think it's a white robe? Hmm. Any guesses? Does it look nice and clean? 
No, it just looked pretty wrinkled. I think you're right. It does have a stain on it. I spilled coffee and wine a couple too many times. That's true. The reason we wear white is to remember our baptism. In our baptism, God says, I love you no matter all of those things that you're going to do in life that are messed up. So we're going to mess up. God says, I'm going to love you no matter what. And so when a pastor or someone else who's leading the service, not just pastors wear that robe, other people can wear the robe too. We are remembering that we are clothing ourselves with Christ. That we are who we are. We bring all those different jobs and vocations and bits about who we are underneath. But when we put on the robe, we get to remind everybody that God's love covers all of us. That God's love is more important than the things that divide us and separate us. And I think that's some pretty good news. Why don't you guys pray with me? Holy and living God, thank you for loving us as your children. Thank you for creating us to be different and loving us with all of those differences. But thank you even more for bringing us together into your family. Help bring peace into where there is brokenness. And help us to see that you are with us through all things. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. You can head on back to your seats. So, 
He gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. They were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home. And declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Word of God, word of life. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated.
the very good that I created before. And if you remember way back to the creation story, God names all the things that are created as good, but humans are named very good. God sees that goodness. God also sees the brokenness in our lives. The things that we don't live into as fully as we should. The things that we've done that maybe intentionally or accidentally hurt others. God sees that too. And still says, you are mine. I love you. Don't be afraid. As I mentioned, there are so many things going on today. Father's Day. For many of us, Father's Day is a day of celebration. I had a great relationship with my father. And yet for many others, Father's Day can be a day of sadness. <clears throat> Maybe because there's death. Maybe because there's abuse. Maybe because the relationship is broken in other ways. And so whatever this day means to you and your family, know that Jesus sees it. Know that Christ shows up in the midst of it. And whatever brokenness there is there, calls us into new life. God calls us into the way of being that we are supposed to be. Today's also Juneteenth. Second time it's been recognized as a federal holiday. One of the milestones of celebrating the end of slavery in our nation. And for many people in the communities that I am from, remember those East Coast cities, this is a big celebration. Although it's one that is honestly pretty new to me. Remembering who we are, our history as a nation, even when it hasn't been pretty, is also part of being disciples of Christ. Being honest with ourselves about what that brokenness has been and saying that God is calling us into something new. God is calling us into be right relationship with our neighbors has a new vision and a new plan for us. That is not easy. <coughs> and so part of that work is remembering those broken pieces. Not just in my life, not just in my family, but in the wider community. Not even just with other Lutherans or other Christians, but with the entire creation that God has made. And seeing how does God's love change those relationships. This weekend is also the feast of remembering the Emmanuel Mount. This is a really tough piece of our history as ELCA Lutherans. You see, a few years ago, a young man who happened to be born and raised in an ELCA congregation got in his head that black people were evil. And so this young man went into a black church, sat, had Bible study with folks, and then murdered them. Simply because of what their skin color was. How do we, people who share that same faith as that man, did something horrible? live into that? How do we recognize the love that God calls us into when there is such a deep hatred sometimes in our own congregations? How do we hold those things together? As Lutherans, we often say we live in the tension, in the in-between space of where God calls us to be and where we are. Of God seeing who we are and God seeing who we are supposed to be. I wish I had an answer. But this is very much where we need to be as the church. It's to say these things are there. If we believe the gospel, if we believe 
believe in a God who came and lived among us and did these incredible things. And that should change how we are acting in the world. Not erasing or changing who we are, but clothing us with the love of Christ. The love that says there is no longer black and white. There is no longer Lutheran and African Methodist Episcopal. There's no longer a Democrat or Republican. There's no longer any of those things that divide you. Because although we may be different, we are all loved by our God. It is not easy. In our gospel today, we see this man who is broken. This man who has not just one, but many demons who are living inside of him. Demons that cause him to act out in his community. Now, if you want to have a discussion about what mental illness might look like, how our understanding of how the mind works, and our understanding of scripture, I would love to do that, but that's way longer than I can give you in just a certain So let's just understand this as this is a troubled man. The things are not right with him and the people who are around him. He's been imprisoned with chains and shackles, and yet those cannot keep him safe from the community. He has no place to live, and so he lives in the tombs, not in all. To that man, Jesus talks. To the person who is troubled, who is outcast by the others, to the one who might not have anyone else to love him, Jesus goes to that person and has this miracle that changes his life. Come out of him, Jesus says to the demons, intending to cast them into the abyss, the darkness from whence they came, and they say, no, we don't want to go back there. We don't want to do that. Jesus said, what is your name? And they say, we are Legion. Because there are so many of us, we can't have a single name. Now if you remember the way Luke tells the story, we jump back to John the Baptist baptizing Jesus in the water. The Holy Spirit drives Jesus out into the wilderness, and for 40 days there, Jesus is tempted by the devil. And every time Satan asks something of Jesus, Jesus rebukes him with scripture and says, no, that is not the way that God calls us to live. And yet today, when the demons ask something of Jesus, Jesus says, okay. And that struck me a little bit. Why does Jesus work with the demons here a little bit? <clears throat> and so instead of this man staying bound, the demons are cast into a herd of pigs who then are terrified, rush down a steep bank, and drown themselves in a lake. Unclean pigs who are not fit to be part of Jewish culture are the vessels by which those demons are taken out of this man. man who could not be part of the community. I wonder if it's because this man's life would be changed. <coughs> that Jesus worked with them this time. Soon after, Jesus is there with his disciples, and that man is clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And what is going on in the town? Sometimes I like to ask questions that aren't rhetorical, and I, I like you to talk to me. This is one of those times. Who remembers what's going on in the town when this man is sitting at Jesus' feet after he's done? Anybody? It's an open book test. You can grab your bullet and look. Chaos? Fear. Fear. 
I bet there was chaos too, but fear is what I was looking for. The owner of that herd that lost his pigs is filled with fear, and he runs into town and tells everyone else, and probably causes that chaos. And they come out, and they see this person, and what are they filled with? Fear. See, the miracle of new life for this person who has been hurting. And their reaction is not joy, thankfulness, hope, celebration, any of those things that make sense to me for seeing somebody healed. It is instead fear. I wonder if it is fear because it's something that they don't understand. This man is supposed to be the not normal person, and now he's not, and so that's just uncomfortable for him. I wonder if the fear was about the cost. Remember, the first person to be afraid who ran into town was the one who owned those pigs. He's lost his herd. He's lost his livelihood so that someone else could become well. And when the things that I have are threatened, I get afraid. Excuse me, the new life, the good creation that God wants us to be, does often come with a cost. Sometimes to a cost of others. And yet that is the vision that God has for us. In Scripture, again and again, when angels, messengers of God, or Jesus himself, show up to people, they say, Be not afraid. Because they know, just like in this story, that's where we go. We are afraid of that change. We're afraid of what comes next. The crowd is so afraid, they drive Jesus out of town. You're not welcome. Savior of the nations, God's son, person who healed this man, you need to leave. And this man begs to follow, to go with Jesus and the disciples. Take me with you. And yet Jesus says, go home. Tell everybody the good news. Go and share this story of how your life was changed. It's not easy. The reception will not always be good. But this is the good news. My friends, God knows you. God sees you just as you are today. With all of your vocations, the things that God has called you to do, with all of the abundant blessings that God has provided you, with all of the brokenness that you bear, God sees you. And yet because of the love of Jesus, God who came into our world, lived with us, died on the cross, and lives again, that love is what covers you. That love is what should change you. That love will see you through your fear and into the new life that God promises you. I don't know where our world is going. I do know that God will be with us. And no matter what happens, that even should death itself come for us, Jesus will stand there at the cross and say, I have been there. You're not alone. I love you. So I send you out the same way Jesus sent that man. Back home, whether that's here in Custer, back home, maybe you're a visitor and that's far away. But wherever it is that you call home, go and tell the good news. Go and say, Jesus is up to something and it's going to change us. But God's love is greater. 
Please be the God for that promise and for that love that we have through Christ. Amen. <coughs>
instead we are sharing with one another the stories of our faith. We are saying, I believe in God who created the universe and all things and all people who are in it. I believe that God loved it so much Jesus came to die to save it and lives again so that something even greater can come. And I believe in the Holy Spirit that brings us together as the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit that is with you and me every day. Let's share the stories of our faith with one another in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand. next finger is the pointed finger. We use this finger to show directions, to point the way for others, and so this reminds us to pray for those who have guided us in life. We pray for teachers, mentors, counselors, pastors, parents, anyone who has helped guide us through life. For them, we now pray. Our next finger is the middle finger. In our culture, showing someone the middle finger is often a sign of anger or of hatred. And yet Jesus calls us to love our enemies. 
So now we pray for broken relationships, for an end to violence where it is present, for reconciliation among enemies, for anyone who is angry with us or anyone whom we are angry with. For them, we now pray. Your next finger is your ring finger. It's the weakest finger on your hand. It needs the assistance of others to have strength to bend and hold on to things. And this reminds us to pray for those who need help or assistance in our lives. Let us pray for those who are ill, facing addiction, isolation, anything where people need assistance. For them, let us pray. Here in Custer Lutheran Fellowship, we especially pray today for the Roosh family, for Dave, Walker, Ralph, Darwin, Gary, Arlie, Margaret, Gary and Carol, Tressa, Patty, Gavin, Don, Neil, Don, and all others who we have named silently and anonymous. And finally, we come to our pinky finger. After we have prayed for others, now we pray for ourselves. Give thanks to God for the blessings that you have. Ask for strength in the face of whatever challenges you have. Now, pray for yourself. together. We raise them up to our God, trusting that he hears us, and all God's children say, Amen. We continue our service with an offering and some special music. Please be seated. Thank you. 